John Morlock is frank, outspoken, and used to getting things done. Take Orange County's bankruptcy back in 1994. He sounded the warnings, then took over and reformed the very treasurer's office that had caused the debacle. As a supervisor, he did more heavy lifting, like hammering out deals to shore up the county's pension plans. But now he's a state senator in the Republican super minority. Hard to get things done, but he's trying, getting a bill passed where he can, and making his views known even when the cause is hopeless. What's wrong with Sacramento? Where is the state headed? We hear from John Morlock next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by... Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Yeah. Enjoying the deal. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Rick Reef, and I'm talking with John Morlock. Senator Morlock, always great to have you on. Uh, so, a as I said, some have called it, particularly the leaders uh, in the uh, uh, Democratic uh, supermajority in Sacramento, a historic session that we've just completed. Hundreds of bills were passed in the last couple of days. Um, uh, here's some of the subjects that were tackled with legislation, affordable housing, immigration, cap and trade, which is a market-based way of dealing with air pollution, gas tax to fix the roads, uh, a nearly $200 billion budget that adds to the state's cash reserves, a lot of anti-Trump legislation on immigration, campus assault, regulations, all that kind of thing. So was this a great historic session for the state legislature? Well, it was fun to have a front row seat. Um, so I guess we would attack a few things. Uh, you know, the, the election on November 8th uh, certainly uh, provided an incredible um, shadow over the entire session for this year. Uh, there was a resolution almost every week, you know, bashing Trump for, for something. And that sort of got old. But Kevin DeLeon, the president pro tem, you know, told me personally, he said, you know, if, when, when, if McCain would have won, I could have handled that. If, if if Romney would have won, I could have handled that, but I cannot handle Trump having won, and, and, and it was visceral, and it was constant. So we had to put up with that, even to the very last minute of session with SB 54 making California a sanctuary state. So that was like the overall theme of the year. It was kind of crazy, and I got up on the last couple of minutes and said, boy, it's too bad the Democratic National Committee couldn't find a better candidate for president. <laughs> Well, but how about, which, which, which was your, did you get a lot of groans when yeah, you I said did. that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. But um, uh, uh, what about the argument, though, that, look, Donald Trump's policies are not good for California, so California has to stand up to him. So then the question is, who's the outlier? <laughs> Donald Trump or California? And so California is saying, wait, we're, we're not the outlier. We're the leading edge. We're the, you know, the, we're, we're, we're pushing where we should be. Uh, so, so the big issue is immigration. Uh, do we fund legal fees for undocumented individuals, you know, and give them due process, which is what the Constitution says we should do, but, but is that the role of the state to underwrite all of that? And so <clears throat> I stood up and said, look, I'm one of eight legal immigrants in the legislature, and as a legal immigrant who went through the front door I'm offended that taxpayer funds are being used for those that didn't go through the front door. So that made for lots of fun. But what do we do with, as uh, you know, the dreamers with, uh, California has a lot of uh, uh, residents uh, who have lived nowhere else. Uh, you know, shouldn't they be protected? I don't know if protected is the right word. Um, the issue is process. You know, how do they get here? Because their parents did something, their parents didn't resolve things. So d does that mean that we should exercise so much grace that dreamers get a free pass? Now, 
they think they should. They, they feel entitled. Uh, and and John, I'm, I'm trying to say there's got to be what's some the balance uh, here. Uh, should we well, be the alternative deporting? Is, should be, no, should, should we be deporting people? You know, Rick, we've been here in California, you and I, for, for quite some time. 20 years ago, half the students in L.A. school districts were not U.S. citizens. Half. The federal government failed to fix the border. They, they failed. And so now the federal government has to solve the problem. They've got to find an appropriate solution to making it easier for those that are here to become citizens. That's the federal government's All right, role. So let's, uh, and, we, and we should be we should be putting together a blue ribbon committee. We should be working with DC and saying California has the following solutions. We didn't do that. Kevin DeLeon never put together a team. And we have some incredible people here in California from Condoleezza Rice. I mean you could give a list that's a mile long that could work with DC and the Trump administration and say, how do we make the transition? How do we be fair? How do we exercise the right amount of grace? I mean, solutions are there. So you're talking about a <coughs> bipartisan approach to doing this. Absolutely. And uh, you're saying the opposite is being done. Nothing's being done. Only tamper tantrums are being done and, and, and signs of, of show. So now what happens with SB 54? Eighty percent of the funding that comes from the federal government to California goes to the cities and counties. And why should Sacramento jeopardize that when we're running programs at the local level. So that's my big concern. Let's not just poke an eye or stick in the eye of, of the president. Let's say, hey, we have a system that we have to deal with because you gave it to us and we're responding to it as we think is best. Now let's help you figure out how to do that nationally so we can all get a good solution for everybody. And I don't see that happen. Okay, uh, are things getting worse in Sacramento? You've been there now two years. Are you? Uh Midway through your term? No, I just finished my first of a, a four year term, four years for oh, my you, current you did. term. Okay, so I, I, I lost was elected. Track. I was elected okay. in all right. a special. So, all right, so four years. You've been there four <coughs> years. What's, no, no, uh, I've only been there two, three. Well, that's that's what third. I mean. Yeah. Okay. So you're midway through your first term. No, so I, was, I, I was. I was elected. Oh, that's in a special. right. That's right. That's right. You had a special, and so you've been there a little longer. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, is it getting worse? Is it getting worse as far as? Uh, cooperation. Uh, I actually have, I think, personally speaking, a good rapport with those on the other side of the aisle. So I would say that the relational aspect is good. I'm not, I have no complaints. Uh, I would say that in my own party, uh, when I have individuals that bolt and vote with the Democrats on big issues, that's where I'm having some frustration. Financially, the state actually when I was elected in 2015, the state was in 46th place out of 50. It's now moved up to 43rd place. So I think I've added value. 43rd out of, uh, for what? 50, out of 50. For so if you said, okay, here's the, number one is the best run oh, state okay. with the best uh -huh. balance sheet, and 50 is the last. Yeah. We were 46, we were in the bottom five. All right, so California's so improving. We're improving because of two things. The first is that Hawaii and Kentucky had to admit their pension problems uh -huh. and just two months ago New York had to restate their financial statements and actually put in the correct numbers for their pension problems so so we're so, actually so you're standing still but others are uh, other others, others are, are showing are passing up. you back okay <laughs> all right okay um, let, let's switch gears a little and uh, uh, well before we switch gears let's talk um, uh, you made an interesting comment recently which I think kind of got to the heart of maybe your big complaint with Sacramento. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said, but this is what you wrote basically. You said that there's two parties in California, the Republican Party and the Union Party. And the unions now have so much influence that they're no longer seeking incremental change, but wholesale ownership of the state. That's, that's a big statement. What, uh, Give an example. What do you mean that the public employee unions or the u just the unions in general are, see, are are taking over the state, owning the state? What, well, what's gone on that, that suggests that? Well, it, 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 less than one in five people in the state belong in a union, like 16%. But for their percentage of the population, they have now controlled uh, the, the, both, both houses of the legislature with super majorities. Public employee unions fund Democrat candidates to the tune of over 90%. So 
the, the Democrats are bought by the by the the public employee unions. So that creates a real interesting dynamic. So to give you an example, uh, Assemblymember Reginald Sawyer Jones out of Los Angeles put together a bill, Assembly Bill 1250 this year, which says that if if a county is going to outsource to a nonprofit to provide services for AIDS or foster kids or whatever, then th they, they have to make sure that pu public employees should be able to do that work first, which means you've got to pay someone full salary plus the defined benefit, pension benefit, and not hire the nonprofit. Now, in his creating this sausage, he exempted cities and then he exempted two counties, and, and it just got really weird. So in committee, in governance and finance, I had to ask him, what was he doing? Because North, I think it was Northwestern, Northern Michigan University was called on the carpet with a, with a claim by Ask Me, the uh, American Federal, you know, this, this big right. national um, employee union, public employee union, and, and they filed a claim because the university had hired a crew to take care of their poison ivy. And the claim was you need to hire employees at the at the university to do that. And and that meant that the university would have to let go of a herd of goats. Because that's what they did. They hired a herd of goats to eat the poison ivy. And I said, where does this go? And it makes me wonder, who's your daddy? And the whole room just went crazy. But I said, who is running this state? And, and that's just one example of a, a number of bills that came so up this year. So did that bill pass? It got held up because I started at a lot of floor sessions asking who is and it started having a little fun with it. Yeah uh, when you, and that's become kind of your call now. Who's your daddy? Who's when your daddy? something comes up now. Who's your daddy? Right okay all right all right yeah yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and obviously you're implying to the Democrats that the union bosses are their are their daddy but when you do that what uh, what do you hear from uh, when you raise these issues and things? What kind of reaction do you get uh, from your colleagues? They uh, they haven't really bothered me about it at all. No one's pulled me aside and said, "What are you thinking?" Um, in fact, Joan Sawyer, Assemblyman Joan Sawyer, and I have known each other longer than I've been in the Senate. And so, even in committee, you see him kind of take a deep breath and say, "Now let me explain my background and what." why I'm proposing this bill and he does I think a rather admirable job of explaining it but it it's the optics of it all and I, I think we were able through this strategy to stop a lot of bills because it made everybody realize wait a second someone's really making an issue of this and but uh, but mm -hmm. has anybody called me on the carpet no all I can tell you is that by the last night they play bingo like you know they, if, if someone says something and one of the squares was Morlock says, who's your daddy? So I know, I know it had an impact because it was the Democrats who put together these bingo cards. Okay, all right, very good, all right. So uh, actually, perhaps somebody will be called, uh, you have been called on the carpet a little because I did uh, invite, knowing that we were gonna be talking about the unions and how you feel about them, I invited three different unions to respond uh, uh, to your uh, comment uh, about the wholesale ownership. One of them responded. It was uh, Bruce Blanning of the Professional Engineers in California government. Uh, they are the engineers for Caltrans, a transportation agency, which you have also been quite they critical love of. They love yeah, me. They love me. They love you, and, and you'll you will, you will sense the love coming through this quote. Uh, he said, "Legislation was recently approved to fix and improve our transportation infrastructure for the first time in decades." The Chamber of Commerce, unions, the Associated General Contractors, the Orange County Business Council, and the California Alliance for Jobs supported the bill. Morlock voted no. Morlock also wrote a bill to award state engineering contracts without competitive bidding, which would double the cost of taxpayers. The legislature wisely rejected this misguided proposal. The organizations representing California's working men and women aren't seeking to waste taxpayer dollars. The problem is people like John Morlock. So that's his his comment. Um, care to oh, care to make? Oh, may I respond? <laughs> so um, SB one is the first point that the legislature, with with just the minimal amount of two thirds votes in both houses, approved this massive gas and car tax. So the business council supported it because it means jobs for. 
contractors, construction companies, engineers, et cetera. So it's so so I'm I'm not even going to debate that one because this tax increase will take effect in November, and when you get your registration bill from the DMV, you're going to hit the ceiling, and 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 you'll know why the voters are going to recall one senator, maybe more, as time goes on. Two, I did a bill that said, look, we need to outsource more at Caltrans. One, uh, the Reason Foundation did a study, and they, they looked at all the states, or how much outsourcing is going on. The average is 50%. Most states outsource 50% of their engineers. Arizona and Florida, 80%. California, 10%. We are so below the mark. So when we hit recessions, we don't lay anybody off. Caltrans has 3,500 engineers that we don't need. They just show up. They sit at the coffee shop. I don't know what they do. And, and, and they don't get laid off. But if we outsource, then you would just tell your contractors, we're backing off. The money's not there. You wouldn't have to lay anybody off. It's the private sector that would have to take the... You know, the, the, the so what is the, the non-competitive hit? bidding, though? Uh, that's, uh, not, that's not even correct. Uh, um, w w w that's um, a lark. That's just something they're saying which is not actually true. Uh, obviously, you go through competitive bidding. This is That's standard operating procedure. That is disingenuous, and that's what it's all about. Because on the floor and in committee, you can lie. And you can make your argument. You can say completely, something completely false, and then everybody votes along with it because there's no chance to rebut. And, and, and that's the kind of nonsense that goes on in Sacramento. It's disingenuous and it's disappointing because the taxpayers suffer for it. Okay, let's talk, let's switch gears a little bit now and talk about an issue that is impacting every community in California around the country, that's homelessness. And we're seeing in Orange County right now, I mean, uh, how, how awful is it that it, at our civic center, the county's civic center, and in the shadow by the uh, Santa Ana River bed, by the, in the shadow of Disneyland and the Big A, you've got these homeless camps now, uh, hundreds of homeless people living there. Um, you as a supervisor worked a lot, and I know you care very, very much about this issue. What is going on with the homeless situation? Yeah, we're trying to take care of the least, the lost, and the last, right? And, and we worked really hard. I, I had legislation approved uh, by Daryl Steinberg SB 585 back in Darryl 2013. Daryl Steinberg's the former Senate uh, Majority President Leader. President Pro Tem, yeah, President right. Pro -tem. And I said, look, uh, he had done in uh, 2004, he had done the uh, uh, Mental Health Services Act. It was Proposition 63. So if you're a millionaire, you get taxed a little bit more, and that money goes to mental health. Well, it, it came to the county, but you couldn't use that money for existing programs. You had to use, use it for new programs. And those new programs were coloring contests and stuff, just stuff, stuff that was, you know, new but not hitting where it itched. Uh, so, we, so one, why do we have a homeless problem? One, we got to deal with the mental illness. Two, we have to deal with the criminal component, which is a result of Governor Brown uh, doing Assembly Bill 109, which released inmates from the state prisons to meet a federal uh, uh, reduction in, in our population. And now those people are on the street. And then three, you have NIMBYism. We have um, housing for the homeless in the winter uh, at our, our uh, I want to say the military bases, but uh, where the reserves, uh, the, the word just escapes yeah. me. But so we, we provide it, but, but, but the cities have not been working on what we call Senate Bill 2 zones, where you provide housing for homeless uh, a, a shelter year long. Or, and, and so the city of Anaheim has stepped up and we have a facility there. But we had pushback from other cities. I mean, we, Santa Ana was a dud. Uh, Fullerton was a dud. Uh, so so we, we had to work on all of those. Santa Ana finally allowed for the ability to use the bus station at the Civic Center, but it's not enough. So these people are going along the riverbed, and it's the same situation in Sacramento. They're along yeah. the riverbed, so too. So what's, what's the solution? We, need to, we, we worked last year on a, 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 a bond measure to issue $2 billion in bonds based on this Prop 63 funding source. And I championed that and got my Republican delegation to come on board. I only got, I got everyone except for one who voted no. So that that would give funding to allow for housing to build it. Because you need, you need to put these people in immediate housing and then you have to diagnose what their mental 
situation is, and then you have to provide the proper assisted outpatient treatment to help them mainstream. Uh, and then you got to work with the criminal element. We have Prop 109, we have, I mean, uh, we have AB 109, we have Proposition 47 and 57 that has released criminals, but it also has reduced crimes from felonies to misdemeanors so that our police officers don't even arrest these people anymore because they don't get put so, anywhere. So, so what I'm trying to do, in a long, make a long story, I, I, we have a Fairview Developmental Center that is closing. The state is no longer going to use that site. So we're trying to say, hey, let's build a campus. Let's try and provide some assistance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess the fourth thing, that if, if we also have a drug issue, opiates and everything that, that, that kids are just tuning out. We gotta help. And so we're trying to do that, uh, following on what we did at the county, what we did with No Place Like Home, and now we're trying to provide housing. Let me ask you, our advocates <laughs> for the uh, homeless, uh, and I guess you're an advocate for the homeless, but, but the people who are, there are some advocates for the homeless who it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, they almost seem to be saying now homelessness is a lifestyle and it should be accommodated. As, as I was reading about this stuff in Anaheim, there, I, I saw a comment that, well, if they close it down here, uh, they'll move to another state. And I'm thinking, homeless people moving to another state to find another riverbed that, that they can live by? It almost, it almost seems like some of it is, you know, like these, these joggers who don't want the homeless people there are bad people for that. Uh, is there some, is, it, it, does that go on and is that a dangerous attitude? That it's now almost a lifestyle <clears throat> to be homeless. I mean, which gets to point five. <laughs> and that is poverty. California has the highest percentage of poverty in the nation. We're number 50 again. We're at the bottom of the heap. So we've had four decades of democratic control of California, and look at the shape we're in. It's dismal, it's sick, because these people can't find jobs. They want to mainstream, they want to live in a house, they want to you know, be you know, back into the, to, to, to occupations yeah. and, and, and lifestyles. But we have, in, in unique ways, we've done s things that shouldn't be done. We are now raising the minimum wage. So what do restaurants do? They let go of a person or two. So we're creating less jobs than more jobs. Our, our solutions keep making the situation worse. And so um, w we've got to reevaluate what's going on. Uh, but we have to find some property in, in, in Orange County, which is very difficult, as mm -hmm. you know, knowing the real estate market where we can somehow build a, an infrastructure that's protected, but we start dealing with yeah. all the key issues, the medical, the mental, the, the, the educational, the, the, the build a resume. Yeah. Let's get these people back on their feet. That's what they want to do. Fairview sounds like a, uh, a great idea. Will there be opposition to it? Well, you're going to probably see my neighbors kind of go crazy because I live in Costa you, Mesa. You would, yeah. I could throw a rock at that facility. Uh, so the mayor's kind of uh, you got some apprehension, but but the the health community, the the Dr. Richard Afables, the the, the Hogs, the St. Josephs, uh, the mental uh, community, the Naomi, uh, they they're all saying this is this is great. And they've kind of built a committee and infrastructure, and we're trying to work now with the Department of General Services to say, hey, when you decide to sell this, work with the county, work with Costa Mesa, work with the community to try and find a good solution so that we take care of this problem. And as you know, it is okay. a big problem. But let's just say that we're trying. Okay, let's, uh, l let's uh, one more thing. We've got a, just a little over a minute left. I'd like to get your views on this. Uh, on July 1, Orange County made its final bond payment to pay off the debt that it had, hit, had incurred from that famous bankruptcy in 1994, the one that really launched your political career. We're looking at a picture right now of you holding up uh, a license plate that says sky fell. Uh, you warned you were accused of being chicken little, but in fact the sky did fall and that and, and it was off and running. The rest is history and, and you're here today. Uh, one, uh, one billion, one and a half billion dollars later, uh, 22 years, one and a half billion dollars in payments after the bankruptcy. What, what lessons uh, were learned and not learned in your opinion? Well, I think it's poetic that uh, 22 years ago I was in this very studio being interviewed on the bankruptcy in December of 1994. So it's kind of special right. to be here, you know, to have lived long yeah. enough to see the bankruptcy debt paid off. Um, you got to pay attention. Read the balance sheet. Read the income statement. 
Orange County had, as a percentage of revenue, interest income that was so high it made no sense. It made no sense. It wasn't the norm. And no one stepped back and said, this doesn't compute. We, we, let's dig a little deeper. Let's just not rely on one person who's doing reverse or purchase agreements and just trust that everything's fine. And, and as you recall, I had to get that data. I had to pay for it. I had to wait all, you know, the, yeah. through the public record. So we need to be more transparent. We should have the general ledger okay. online. We should. Very good. Thanks okay. for letting and, me and you're this. still and, and you're and you're still fighting those battles. Darn 22 right. years later, right, John. <laughs> thanks so much for coming on. That's it for now. Thanks again to my guest, John Morlock. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live. They are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming.